Welcome again. This is Dr. Ali Mugabel. This is the last part of operations on multiple random variables. The title is sampling, estimation, and some limit theorems. Sampling, estimation, and some limit theorem. We need to develop some terminology, so let's go over some important terminology. When we do an experiment, like for example, measuring a DC voltage, this is called the measurement is called sample we're collecting sample imagine that we have a factory which produces let's say mobile phone chargers uh, or um, dc suppliers so uh, the measured dc voltage is called a sample we can collect samples we can measure different dc voltage levels for example every measurement is called a sample now the measurement is an estimate of the true value. We, when we do measurements, we're trying to estimate the true value. When we do lots of observations, when we do lots of measurements, when we collect multiple samples, we are doing observations. And using a large number of sources will result on the process which is averaging. To get the average, we need to have lots of observations and we can average things out. Now, with n samples over time, under the assumption, under the given model, voltages, statistical properties stay unchanged with time. If they change with time, then the process of observation should consider this change. In many cases in real life, we, uh, we develop a model, for example, where we assume that things do not change with time, and this is why we take the measurements at different instances in time. Those terminology could have some sort of overlap, but they have distinct meaning. Sample, estimation, observation, and of course we have average and the model that we implement. If you want to estimate, estimate the mean, the power or variance, we have estimators for the mean, for the power and variance. Our random variable x sub n represent identically distributed independent at least pi pairs. So we assume that things are iid at least pi pairs. We assume that all of them has the same mean x bar and the same variance sigma x squared. And now if you want to find estimate the average, the average is um, represented with x bar. But we have this little hat here to say that it's an estimate. So estimating, because we don't have all the samples. What we are collecting is only n different samples. So estimate of average of n is defined to be the following. If you want to estimate the average where you don't have all the sample, if we take all the readings, all the samples, then we have the true average. But if we only collect, collect n observations, then we are estimating the average. We can estimate the average by summing all the observed values and divide by n. This is a, a, a mean estimator, estimation of the mean. Okay, The hat is used to represent the estimate. I just mentioned that, for example, this is x hat is, uh, is the mean, and this is the estimate. This hat represents the mean of the estimate. So we can define formally the estimator. It's a measurement function. It's defined to be x bar hat equal to 1 over n summation of all observations. The sample mean, it's also called the sample mean. How to estimate how the estimator perform? Is this a good estimator or not? A good estimator is usually or should be unbiased, unbiased, it should be unbiased and consistent. Let's see what's the meaning of a good estimator and when do we call it unbiased and when we call it uh, consistent. For the mean estimator, which is defined to be by the following equation, all right, the expected value of the estimator, if we take the expected value, now from here we, here we substitute the definition of the estimator, we can take 1 over n outside the expectation because it is not a random quantity, and the expected value of xn is x bar. So in fact, 
the expected value of the estimator equals to what we want to estimate. And that's for any value of n. It's not function of n. This is called unbiased estimator. Any estimator for which the mean of the estimator of some quantity equals the quantity being estimated, then this is called unbiased estimator. It might sound like over obvious because what you want to estimate is uh, turns out to be what you estimated. But uh, for example, I give you a biased estimator. If somebody wants to find the average of his weight and then he always measure the weight after the lunch, then he will end up with a biased estimator. Maybe there is a little bit of bias, but it's called a biased estimator because it's not the true average of, of, of the weight. So we call it biased. The example shown here is not biased. If it turns out, for example, that we have here plus one or plus two or whatever, then this is called bias because it's not equal to what we want to estimate. Okay. The variance of the estimator, which is an important second measure, if you look at the, at the variance by definition, you take the estimator minus its mean and then you square. This is called the variance of the estimator. If we open the bracket here and let's take the expectation. If you take the expectation, okay, I'm coloring this with blue. These two together is, are going to, to end up as uh, minus x squared. And uh, now I'm just changing the order, so this is nothing but can be written as double summation because of the square. I'm using different variables here, m and n, to distinguish the two summation. And now this should equal to 1 over n squared, and we have the double sum here. Okay, now assuming independence by pair, if they are independent by pair, then this can be split. Okay, it's either equal to ex squared when they are equal, and it's going to x squared, x bar squared when they are not equal, because we can separate them. In this case, for example, this is going to be expected value of xn times the expected value of xm, which is x bar times x bar, which is x squared here, x bar squared. Okay, so if we go back now to the double summation, we can say that the double summation, this part, will have two of k, two k, one of two cases, for example. It's going to be, um, if they are equal, we get n cases which are equal, so the summation will result in n, n times ex squared. The other part of the summation is the remainder. Remember that the total number of cases we have here is n squared. If we remove n cases from them which are equal, what remains is n squared minus n. For all the remaining n squared minus n cases, we'll get x bar squared. And the 1 over n squared come from inside, uh, from the summation here. So this expression turns out to equal to the variance. Uh, I'm, I am uh, using subscript n here to, to, to indicate that this variance depends on the value of n. So this last expression here can be written as, if you simplify things here, okay, some terms will cancel out. And what, what remains here, for example, if you, if, you, if you multiply over n squared, I will get here from here minus x bar squared plus 1 over n uh, expected value of x squared. And then we have plus 1 minus 1 over n x bar squared. So this term okay, is going to cancel with this term. Right, so what remains is these two quantities, which is nothing but the variance over n. That's to say the variance of the estimator equal to the variance of, of the variance how accurate is our estimator 
how does it oscillate around the correct value depends on how many values you will measure if you want to measure the average of your weight and you just take one or two readings you get large variance as you take more readings the accuracy of the estimator becomes more accurate remember that sigma x is the variance of your weight sigma x squared it's a totally different thing it shows how your weight changes but this is the variance of our estimator it's not of your weight it's our of our estimator for a given n samples and that turns out to be sigma x squared divided by its function of n as n grows our variance become less and we have a better estimator so as n goes to infinity sigma x squared goes to zero for large values we will estimate the correct quantity with the probability equal to one as we decrease the number of values we have more variance around the correct value if that's the case if as you increase n you you get close you get a variance equal to zero we call it consistent estimator okay it does not oscillate as you increase the values it constantly help you measure the correct value consistent estimator so we have unbiased and consistent estimator it's consistent if the variance of the estimator decreases as we increase n now let's highlight the the importance of being consistent using Chebyshev inequality uh, if you recall from before the Chebyshev inequality was given by the following expression it, it tells you that the probability uh, of being around the estimated value or the mean would be greater than or equal to a small value epsilon epsilon and that probability will be less than or equal to sigma x squared over epsilon squared for the estimator we are replacing sigma x squared with sigma xn squared divided by n so this is what we did here now as n grows this term would cancel and we will get a probability of of the error is equal to um, we will have a probability of error of that we are equal to one that we are um, around the mean as n goes to infinity this becomes equality and we get the exact estimation so as n goes to infinity probability approaches one and we get consistent estimator let's see an example estimate the mean up to five percent of the true value with probability 0.95 with n equal to 50 sample to estimate the mean with this probability we're going to look at uh, Chebyshev inequality so this quantity is going to be um, just by direct substitution all right so estimate the mean up to five percent of the true value with the probability of 0.95 so this must be less than or equal to 0.95 and then just directly substituting so this is five percent of of the true value and we can now solve for this to be true x bar must be less than or equal to square root of 160 times sigma x so it's it's only going to work if this condition is met another way to ask a better question maybe is just if i ask you how many samples are required to achieve a given um, a given accuracy so another question is to ask about the minimum required number of samples for a given distribution and you can try with Mat that with matlab so you can generate samples pick five or ten try to find the average and as you increase the number of samples you get a better accuracy we looked at the estimation of the mean similarly we can define the estimation of the power and the variance so if you want to estimate the mean here is the equation if you want to estimate the power okay it's estimate of x squared then you sum the squared divided by n but if you want to estimate the variance you subtract the mean squared but then you divide by 1 over n minus 1 remember this is estimation if you have all the samples if you have all the samples and you want to find the variance you divide by 1 over n but if we have only just part of the samples and we want to estimate the variance we better divide by 1 over n minus 1 so estimation to estimate the power and in, in, in the to estimate the power of a random variable we have this quantity if you want to estimate the variance then you divide by 1 over n minus 1 okay where of course x is the mean an estimate of the mean so the estimation of the variance requires the estimation of the mean to start with 
So look at this. It says the, the, un, the uh, this is unbiased. If we replace one over n minus one with one over n, it becomes biased. If you apply the the test, you get biased. If you look at the expectation, we use one over n when we know all the samples and it's not estimation process. So if somebody give me numbers, say find the variance, I will ex I will substitute in the, in the formula. I will divide by one over n. But if we have if I'm, if I'm doing an experiment, I'm just collecting some samples. I should divide by one over n minus one. Otherwise, I have a biased estimator. Here is the example. It says mean and variance estimate. So we have the following samples. We are given 11 samples for a random variable, voltage source with mean equal to 4 and variance equal to 16. It says estimate the quantities from the given uh, data. So to estimate the, the mean, I'm just summing all the values. I have 11 of them. Divide by 11, which is n, I got 3.973. And that's... Uh, probability of error less than uh, 1%. Of course, uh, these are given data. I can make them more or less. Now, if you want to estimate the variance, then remember that you divide by 1 over 10. And then we get 0.1 minus the variance square. So this is, this is going to correct for the fact that we don't have the true mean. And the answer to this one, of course, variance, if this is measured in voltage, this is going to be voltage square because this is the expected value of x, this is the expected value of x squared. Be careful about the units. Huh? So uh, if you compare this with the given value, that's an error of 7.8% compared with 16. If you subtract this from 16 and divide by 16, you get, um, you get a 7.8%. Of course, any other samples, any other even samples would give different mean and different variance, but this is just for the example that we have done. Remember that these are not all the values. This is just some samples from big uh, population. Now let's conclude here with, uh, with the weak and strong laws of large numbers. The weak law of large numbers says if, if we have identical and at least pair in, pairwise independent random variables, then as we increase the number of samples, the probability that we estimate the true mean is going to be one for any value of epsilon for any value of uh, error we guarantee that the the, the, the error will be less than epsilon with probability equal to one uh, the large law or the strong law sorry that we have the weak law and the strong law of of, uh, of large numbers says it's not going to approach only because this is we're saying it in a weak way it's the error will be less than epsilon here we're saying uh, with large number of n's, it is going to be exactly equal to x. And this is why we call it the strong law of large numbers. Okay, so uh, as you can think of this about the man of, on the street believes on low average and low uh, and on the weak law of large numbers, and scientists can say it with uh, a numerical certainty. They, they can think of the strong law of large numbers. On the side here, you can see an example where we are picking, um, let's say, dots or coins at, uh, at random. They are blue and green. As we increase that with time, you can see that it shows here the, the average of, e of each. And as we increase the number, then it, it becomes more stable that half of them is blue and half of red. If, you, if it goes back again, you'll find in the beginning, we have small variations. It comes again. See, the variation is large. As the number increases, our estimation of the mean becomes becomes more accurate. So this, this demonstration shows the concept of increasing the number make the estimation uh, more accurate. With this we conclude. Uh, thank you very much for being good listeners. Uh, with this also we conclude the part about uh, operations on random variables. So we will also consider the random processes. So we'll see you there. Thank you very much. And uh, please share the video with your colleagues. Thank you very much.